Good morning, good morning. Take a minute to answer in the chat. Good morning, good morning. I love people making doctor's appointments. I also suck at it real hard. I literally um, forgot today. I need to do it in the break. I appreciate you reminding me. Less social media, absolutely. Oh my gosh. It is a hot mess out there, y'all. On social media. I'm sorry about that. Mm. Rebecca, do you have COVID crud or? Nope, just seasonal crud. Oh, that sounds okay. I've never heard of the word crud before. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about you working through that. Good news is I have a future as a lounge singer. It's a very Heard. sexy voice. My favorite. Mm. Okay. All right, folks. Just put a little calendar reminder to check in with yourselves and take care of yourselves. Um, and for some of us, it's like doing a lot of tasks and for some of us, it's being with other people. And so whatever your thing is, my husband's had COVID for the last five days and we've just been walking around with masks inside the house and yeah. And he's watched a lot of reality TV. So a lot of Mary the First Sight for our family this week. Um, All right, we'll take it offline. Um, yes, love is blind also. Yes, of, of course, a hundred percent. Um okay, just a quick peek at our group norms. Um self-care, community care, get up, get some water, stretch. Um, yep, I love it. We are gonna be in a lot of breakout spaces today and so I'm going to encourage you to be on camera with your peers, especially when it's just the two of you. So someone is not looking and chatting to like a black box. Okay. Let's look at our agenda. We're diving into relationships. So our first session was figure was focused on diagnosing equity issues. And I think for some of us, even starting to think about what are what they are, right? Like where are we feeling challenged in our work? And then our second session was focused on thinking about what solutions look like. And we had a, a working session. And today we're gonna dig into the relationships piece of it, the relationships that we have with other people. And next week it's gonna be relationships that we have with ourselves. 
and our relationship to equity and social change. And so today's session is going to operate a little bit different than how we've done it in the last couple, where we're going to do framework tool, framework tool, so that we're practicing like in real time. And it's going to be a little rapid fire, right? And so I'm going to encourage you to be here, here. Um, as we move through, I think we're going to do four back-to-back -back breakouts. I know it's a lot. It's a lot. Yes. Um, four. Okay. So this is for you. I want you to, you know, just test, test your voice this morning. Um, some of you probably haven't spoken yet because it's really early in the morning so what did you do since last week? What are you struggling with in the context of your equity challenge, figuring it out, figuring out your solution? Did you share your plan with somebody? Um, if so, what did that look like? And then did you do your homework and think about who is in the sphere of influence, who are your stakeholders. So take a moment, have a look at this. Everything. Everything. <laughs> okay, welcome back. Um, hey, everybody. How did it go? What came up for folks? What came up for folks? What did What did you do? In the past week, who did you share stuff with? Feel free to come off of mute. Pretty pleased with sugar on top, my friends. Um. Well, for for me, I think it was a lot of internalizing. Um. I think week to week, it's been a lot of internalizing. Um, and I think that was something that we also kind of shared in our group um, with Sevda and Dairon um, is, you know, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of great, rich information, but just really taking it in and, and seeing how we can apply them to our challenges, just like in our, you know, state and where we're at and, and our roles. Um, so that that was kind of great to kind of see others, you know, processing and internalizing as well. We appreciate that. It is a lot of information. I would say for our group, this is Danita. I would say for our group, um, uh, still in the discovery phase, um, for me at least, uh, in the discovery phase, asking great, great questions, trying to um, come to a space uh, if you if you fear consultant and and maybe don't have a client or in a consulting realm I'm not a consultant so I actually work for an organization um, um, so I'm actually learning from those that are consultants in the space that they're in and the types of questions that are different from the questions that I would have or that my approach is um, in an organization um, for me I I was letting my uh, the group know that my struggle is, trying to, which I have a terrible habit of doing, of trying to solve the problem as it's unfolding. Um, mm. And I have to come to a space where, again, slowing down the fast brain to allow whatever is happening to unfold um, first fully, and then approach from whatever lens of equity or uh, DEI, DEIJ, um, that it comes to be. But sometimes it's a fault when you have knowledge or you've seen something before, it's still not the same context, even if you've seen it before, right? So I'm in a different context and a different organization that have different approaches. And so um, allowing things to unfold. Mm. Heard. Halting the fast brain is very, very difficult. It is, it is. Especially when you have a big cup of coffee that's supposed to get it going. Zoom. <laughs> Saying. That's counter, right? I'm trying to slow it down, yet I'm doing the things that are speeding it up. Life mm. is crazy. 
Mm, let's hear from maybe two more folks. What came up? I guess I'll just say that we were talking about the the challenge we set out to address and I was sharing this kind of stakeholder. I liked that exercise and um, I had a conversation with one of them this past week, one of the, uh, someone from that stakeholder group and they lifted up unintended consequences of the action we were thinking about that I hadn't even grappled with at all I, or that potential unintended consequences I should say but just like the complexity of um, it's not always as straightforward as I might think it could be um, and not being really glad to take this slow change um, time to really um, listen and think about where that might occur. Yeah. Research work. A lot of people think they know until they get out there like, yikes, oops, wait, what? I really appreciate you doing that and recognizing that space. Yeah, Who else is? Yeah. All right, I'll go need to hear so um I, I was just I, we were talking about how being in between jobs and I'm still doing consulting work as well and how there's a conversation that we're having with one of the organizations on the importance of male allyship and the next session that we are doing is we're trying to build out the session we've done one so it's a four-part session we've done one to establish the grounds of you know, definition and things for that. We want to do the next session that's going a little deeper and we try, I'm trying to find an apt case study so I can put them into breakout rooms and, you know, literally let the men beat out the solution out of it kind of a thing. And we've been, I've been struggling to find the right case study. So that's my equity challenge of the week. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which one is the apt one to put through where it's, you know, it also talks about what's in it for me. Uh, where and I really love Danita's perspective, saying sometimes it's not about what's in it for me, what has not been in it for women <laughs> across so many years, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's been the conversation that I put out there. So yeah, yeah going back to what you were saying, Chris, research. <laughs> Struggling with research. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful clarity to get to a point where you can ask such a direct question that you know that you need to answer though, right? Like it's, wait, wait, oh, I need a case study. Zoom, there, that doesn't fit, that does. I appreciate that you are on that journey. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Relationship. Um, who here feels like they do relationships pretty well? Just give me like a fist to five. Fist is like, I'm not great at it. Five is like, super bueno. Oh, got three, four, three. I'm going to ask you, what do you mean by doing relationships? Being in relationships. In, okay. Yeah, or, yeah. Okay. So, um, ooh, two out of five. Well, that's like an honesty check. Um, so, you know, one of the things um, that we say a lot in equity work is tell on yourself. Get in the habit of telling on yourself um, rather than presenting a version of you that you think is going to be accepted or right like um and so today's case is me telling on myself um 
which I don't do very often. And my therapist is always calling me out on it. Um, every week, every session. Um, right. So I don't think I know any of you from when I lived in Seattle in my twenties, but I lived in Seattle in my twenties and in 2014, I woke up one day and decided I was going to leave my husband, my ex-husband. And three weeks later, I was on a plane to India where I had not lived since I was 10 years old. And I, I moved to India because I wanted a change of pace. And I'd also, you know, experienced this life as a person of color in the United States for 15 years at that point. And I moved back to India and like experienced a lot of privilege all of a sudden that I didn't have here, that I didn't have here. The entire time I lived there, by the way, like I didn't, like I didn't even lose my accent. Um, and I got a job building an online teacher education platform and got to travel all over the world. And in my first year of living in India, this was me. Um, I had a very cute haircut. It was very, it was like very trendy and very inappropriate for the work that I was doing. And I like had this huge apartment. I had help for the very first time in my life. Like we had never had any house help when I was growing up. And I had this like auntie who would like make my meals, um, which was, you know, it was amazing. She, like my clothes were always ironed. I got to take a lot of vacations. Um, it was like peak vacation moment of my life. Um, and I also spent a lot of time in low income private schools, government schools, and all of my sort of like fair skin, you know, like US educated privilege. I didn't actually think about what I knew about the lives of teachers in India specifically, because I was riding this high and I felt like I, I knew I'd been a public school teacher in Chicago, which is a very hard place to be a public school teacher. I'd also taught at the University of British Columbia when I was in graduate school. Um, and this is of course like processing a lot in hindsight, even the job that I got, I got it because of my privilege. Um, and not because of merit. Like I'd never spent a single day of my life teaching in any kind of a school in India. And just about everybody I worked with in that environment um, came from a lot of wealth. They were educated in really expensive private schools. They went to college or graduate school overseas, which like, of course, also in hindsight, I'm like, how did your parents afford that living in India? Um, and even though I'd grown up in a very working class family, the accent and like the hair and the skin and the height, um, it just made my life like really, it just made my life really incredible. Um, and six months into having this job, I went to the state of Bihar, which if you know India has a reputation of being like where People have really low literacy rates. Um, and I went to a very rural part of Bihar to start a pilot. And I get there and the hosts are super welcoming. Um, and we get into like the first morning, I'm gonna be there for like four or five days. We get into the first day of training sessions with their teachers and everybody's sitting on the floor. People don't have devices. And my colleague that I'm traveling with has translated my entire PowerPoint presentation into Hindi. And at this point, it's been like 15 years since I've had to read and write in another language, right, other than English. And it's really rusty. And I think it's even an overstatement to say that it's rusty. I knew the English deck front to back. Um, I knew it, I'd used it, I practiced with it. And, but the Hindi deck, not so much. And so on this first day we break for lunch and the founders of the organization that are running this pilot with me, come to me and basically tell me that I, 
I got like, I can't teach the rest of the three and a half days. And he's very gentle. And he, he basically says, look, like go sit with the teachers and listen and observe. You, you can't be here using this deck that you don't know how to read. And we spend like four days in Bihar. And the day that we left, he told me among other things that I really needed to have a much stronger grasp on language if I was gonna keep doing this work and if I was gonna keep doing work in rural India. And over the next six months, they um, would send me like their session evaluations in Hindi over WhatsApp. Um, I spent a lot of time um, relearning how to read and write with like the little kids books, you know, um, where like you like write in over kind of like the dotted lines. And at the end of the pilot, um, we learned a lot of really incredible things from that particular relationship. We built a much better product. Um, how we thought about content had changed pretty dramatically. And we went to 10 other states. Um, and every pilot after that particular pilot, right? This pilot in Bihar, we we approached it very differently. And my biggest realization in this time was that I wasn't I wasn't in these places to make clones out of like Teach for India fellows or the teachers at the British school. Um, I was there to like learn and play a support role and. We had some some amazing successes and we had some like pretty catastrophic failures as, as well. And and that founder, right, this guy who's like standing in the front of the room, he went on to become um, an Ashoka fellow. And like since since then, he's done some pretty incredible work in education in Bihar. And I would say that those four days were some of the most pivotal moments of my career. And so for today, right, like the truth of working with people and in spaces where we're not familiar, that are not, I would say maybe home territory, we have to know who we are and what influence we hold, who the people around us are, what their issues are, as well as what their vision is for their world. And our true role is to activate and support and mobilize the communities that we're engaged with. So for any social change endeavor to be sustainable and valuable, we have to engage with community in really different ways than we're used to. And we have to interrogate power structures. And I feel really lucky and really honored that I have this interaction very early in my time in India so I could kind of course correct um, and show up better. So that's the case. Um, we can listen, we can do that for other people. We can be in community in more meaningful ways. I'm gonna pass it to Pierce. Um, what are our knowledge ancestors for today's session? We have a few. We have a few things that uh, we sit in and keep in mind as we try to uh, discuss this topic, because um, I'm just gonna be honest with y'all, uh, in many ways, personally, this might be my favorite topic. No, mm, we'll see. It's between uh, session three and session four, but in the work that we've been discussing, we 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 kind of. Uh, I wouldn't say the phrase is trick, but we discuss with people the importance of addressing social, social, equitable social change issues by talking about the problems and trying to strategize how to move things forward. But I'd argue, and I'm trying to remember myself, that the core quality necessary to be able to do this work well is figuring out the relationships that you hold as you do it. And in doing that, the first thing that we discuss is relationality. I'm gonna nerd out very quickly. How many people here maybe have heard of the name Descartes before? Possibly. If you've heard of, I think therefore I am, 
that, that that's the guy that came up with it. Valuable, makes sense from the Renaissance. I'm going to dunk on him. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about in many ways, uh, there the the insight is valuable and it helps you understand where you sit in the world um and also is has been used as a resource to separate our impact on the things that matter there's another phrase that you might have heard many different places um obviously on the continent they use it constantly um it's called ubuntu i am because we are right this concept of relationality um, focuses on the idea that everything that we are and become, um, all the things that we do to engage with the world, have meaning because of the relationships that it forms, creates, and intensifies, or changes the nature of. So it's important to remember as you do this work um, that for it to be practical, let's even just talk practically. As you do a social change endeavor, one of the core main ways that you can recognize if it's been successful is if a web of support helps keep it going if you were to take your hands off of it. It is about making sure that it can be relationally sustainable. And that's why it's a core focus of what we're doing in this work here. So the next topic as well is about trust building in solidarity. One of my skill sets, one of, one of the fields that um, I am way too deeply trained in uh, is design thinking, it's participatory design. And for the past 15 to 20 years, one of the core skill sets that people discuss constantly to be able to make an innovation is empathy. You have to be able to understand how to walk in someone else's shoes. That's why we do research. That's why we engage in a lot of relational work. That's why we are valuable advocates because I can say, I know them so I can speak to you about what they need, right? This is deeper. This is about instead focusing on the knowledge about how a society, how a community, how a person works and what they need is based on my interpretation of it is about trust building and solidarity, what we mean by that is building a relationship with somebody sufficiently so that you can be able to sacrifice for their needs, for their endeavors, and build, build resources, build tools, build bridges to help them reach their own goals as well. It's about acknowledging someone else's agency and building up their ability to do so, potentially at your own sacrifice, instead of saying, I'm going to hold the knowledge for myself about what the relationships actually are. It's a next stage and is very valuable, very important when doing any of this type of work. And the third topic, to be clear, is a concept that uh, honestly, I love nerding about the most. Uh, you've heard of systems thinking, you've heard of systems mapping, you might have heard some of the some of the uh, students, your colleagues, some of the folks uh, mention what that means in different environments and spaces. It is a deep topic, it takes a lot of time, and honestly, we won't have enough time in this specific space to go into depth about it, but it is essential. It is essential in this space because what it requires you to do is zoom out and understand the map of relationships and how those relationships cause things potentially outside of the, the goals or the visions of any one of those individual actors. We live in systems. You might have heard systemic oppression, systemic change, systemic inequity. This is a skill set that you can use to understand what those systems are, the basically building the alphabet of that and learning how to do that. The, the important thing here is recognizing that you're not the only person that holds these relationships. Everyone holds them, people, organizations, uh, laws, cultures, relationships. And the more you can figure out the deep structure of those systems together, the more readily that you can try to build something that sustains itself, that builds a new system that is more healthy. So we'll be talking a little bit about that and you will have resources for that in the future um, after the course, once we've uh, hit on our pieces here. So number one, relationality. Number two, trust building and solidarity. 
And number three, understanding how to think and map the systems of relationships we're going to be discussing. Does that make sense? It's a lot, a lot of information. There will be a lot more. But for now, I believe it's time for a bit of a break. Is that and I really understand what you are talking about. I think it's important to state that there's a, a complicated and nuanced and non-trivial uh, relationship between the identities that one can hide and the ones they can't. And that obviously has been a long and consistent conversation, especially over the past couple of years, um, one of which I have definitely seen in the States, but I know for sure exists in many other environments, especially also in Botswana. Danita? Um, in looking at this, um, I always struggle with the word privilege. Um, I really do. I'll, I'll, I, I just do. But um, it is what it is in cer certain circumstances. Um, I'm at the intersection of both of these as, as I identify. Um, the unfortunate piece is we were raised, my uh, siblings and I were raised, <clears throat> you have the education and the college degree, unlike, uh, I'm sure there, there are many families and nationalities who say the same thing. You have education, you can surpass. The unfortunate piece is as you grow older, as I've grown older, you don't, you're still looked at as marginalized. Yet you, I don't feel marginalized until I do. <laughs> and then it's, uh, then it's like, hey, wait a minute this, how, how is it that I'm still looked at as this? Before you even say something, before you, you, you can just walk into a room and there's there's already a, a thing that is that is there that is not complimentary. Um, and so in my mind, it is to suppress that and just move forward. Because there's, mm -hmm. I was just, uh, we were in our group, there's, it comes to a point where I'm not looking for someone's validation Regardless, now I'm older, the younger Danita would have told you something different. I would have been trying, trying desperately, wear pearls, do this, shrink yourself. Don't be so like some, uh, Aparna, you were saying your height. Don't be so tall. You're the tall black girl who, at least I'm, I'm not as light skinned, um, but I'm fairer skinned. I don't know what that really means. Um, Cause I have my daughter, if you see her, you would probably figure out like, what is she? Um, but it's interesting to look at this list and to see where one is yet to experience life and to experience where I am um, can be challenging at times. Um, challenging in the sense of, it's, it, will it ever end? And unfortunately, I don't believe that it will. Mm. So then, So then how do you move about and my response right now at this age in my context is you move about. You just move, you move about and do what you can for yourself and for others. For me, it's for others and myself, which, you know, however you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to share that. Thank you for sharing it. Leandro. Hey, um, so... I found this or these lists really interesting because I realized that like because I occupy so many of the marginalized or target areas like I think that like sometimes I forget that I'm not absolved from being oppressive in other areas and so um there like I found myself thinking about like I do have a college degree but like my parents didn't help me and I worked like I like I'm finding all these different ways for like I'm not privileged I work my way up and that's exactly what a lot of white people say when they're like I'm not privileged I had a hard life and so it was so interesting to kind of experience that um that sense of like who I can't be oppressive I'm an oppressed person knowing that there are still ways that I can oppress people. So it was kind of a, I don't know, a, a moment of ick for me when I was trying to figure out how to explain away the privileges I do have because I am so solidly on the left-hand side for most of these categories. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of put it out there that it felt a little bit icky to try and be like, but am I all that privileged though? No, because like, 
I don't want to admit that I am oppressive either, but it is, it, it exists. Like I will say and do problematic things and I will le like learn, unlearn, relearn, but I didn't like the ick of wanting to kind of shy away. And I felt more like hiding where I was privileged rather than hiding where I was marginalized. So that's kind of where I fell there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I think for me, one of the things that um, that I always say, one, <clears throat> that always stood out to me is I grew up in Nigeria, surrounded by Black people. And I didn't realize I was Black until we moved to England when I was 10. Um, just that whole idea of not even recognizing um, the being part of a target, um, being part of the target group until you are not the dominant and um or not realizing that you're part of a privilege or agent group until you are you know in in light of other people and so how being in community and being um part of society um kind of highlights some of these things um for us without us realizing that um prior to is kind of an interesting experience um, to um, to go through. Um, you know, when oftentimes when you hear people say, you know, I'm not, you know, there's not, there's no such thing as white privilege. And I'm like, in relation to what um, is, is the most important thing. Like all of this is in relation to something else or somebody else. Um, so yeah, that was that's always been a, an interesting um, thing to me because I I actually think for me growing up in Nigeria is a privilege um, that my kids don't have. Um, I grew up with my you know very privileged in in terms of you know my doctors, all the engineers, everybody around me. Um, representation was not an issue. Um, my kids growing up here in Canada though, um, the representation is you know something that we have to seek out for them um and so for me like i've always had that framework of you know being black doesn't mean that you know i can't be anything or anyone that i want to be because i've seen those examples represented my whole life um so yeah so that's it's just a processing thing for me I actually fall very much on the on the right side on the privileged agent side with many of my identities, but here in North America, um, oftentimes it's that first, that racial, that then takes precedence over all the other privilege um, stuff that I have, and that it's a very interesting um, place to be in. Yeah. Nito, I see your hand raised. We'll hear from you, and then we're going to move on. Need to, did you did you want to respond? You're you're muted right now. Yes, sorry. I'm I'm just moving rooms trying to figure the best network. Gotcha. Um, that that activity was very interesting for me because it reminded me. So I did my degree in Europe and I was doing a comparative analysis of my life in Europe, how marginalized I felt and coming back to India how privileged I feel so it was such a strong reminder of why I consistently want to stay back here in my mm -hmm. country because I feel safe and privileged and I feel home every single day and when I have my friends and family saying oh you have such a such a Western mindset, which is, I think is biased, but anyways, and all of that, you should move abroad, you should try Canada, you have so much more opportunities, like the work that I do needs me here, <laughs> because the challenges in, the, in what I hear from all of you, right, the challenges in that part of the world is different from the challenges that's in this part of the world, so that for me was a very strong reminder of why I'm here doing the work that I'm doing and how privileged I am. 
Yeah. Oh, I feel that. I feel it. Um, I really hope for, you know, folks, white bodied people in this group, I, I really hope that you can hear what's being shared this morning and the really deep, deep, deep legacy of colonization, of white supremacy, of racism. Um, hey, I want to cover two things. I'm going to go through it faster than I want to. Um, but I'll share a resource with you that's a video um, that you can watch. And it is Le Dr. Leticia Nieto giving a talk and, and diving deeper. And I listen to this talk probably once a month. Um, I listen to it all the time. It's like the Beyonce soundtrack, which I also listen to like every day. And because it, I, I need the reminders, um, I, I need the reminders uh, to be in right relationship with folks. And so she calls it the, the a skills model. Um, we're tying it back to some of the work that we are doing around power, right? Liberatory outcomes, liberatory actions. So we're gonna connect it to, uh, we're gonna connect it to that. So what are some of the habits and behaviors? Um, when we have privileged agent identities, right? And so there's some default behavior and they start with indifference. And indifference looks like saying, what does this have to do with me? Like, why should I pay attention to it? Or you're not paying attention to it at all. You're not paying attention to it at all, right? And that is the folks that are in the target column, right? Those identities. Another default habit or behavior is distancing. And what distancing sounds like is, I don't have a problem with those people, or maybe I do have a problem with them and I don't want to engage with them. Um, or, well, I'm not like other people in my privileged identity groups. I'm not like those people. I'm not a racist, I'm not homophobic. People out here, they are, but I'm gonna distance myself from that. And then there is, in her model, she calls it inclusion. I call it integration. Um, and it's the skill of, I don't see you as being different. I don't see you as being different. I see all people the same way. When I moved out here to the Pacific Northwest, I heard for the first time in my life, people say things like, I don't see color and I don't care if you're pink or green or purple. And I was like, okay, but I'm not a Teletubby. Like, what do you, like human beings are not coming in those colors. Like, you know, like we're not the Power Rangers. Um, and what that behavior is, is that you're welcome to be here but I don't want you to be different. I don't want you to show up your differentness. Um, like dress in ways that makes me comfortable, speak in ways so that I'm comfortable, eat food. Um, don't bring chicken curry in your lunchbox. Like I don't wanna smell that, right? So these are, these are default behaviors. Um, and it takes a great deal of awareness, education, doing the work all day, every single day to jump over to the other side, right? Which is starts with just really awareness of my own lived experience and also trying to understand what is the lived experience of somebody with target identities, recognizing my role and my advantages and taking responsibility for my own learning and growth. Taking responsibility for my own learning and growth. Um, not slipping into indifference. Making data, right? Making decisions based on data and awareness. And then there is accompliceship, which in the model, in the original model, it's allyship. We took it out because it's, it's been, it's, it's been, I don't know, I, I want to say bastardized, but like 
this word like means less and less every single day, um, allyship, right? And so accomplish ship, we'll, we'll, we'll try that on. It's the ability to normalize the discomforts of guilt and shame associated with awareness and putting them towards social justice. Ability to normalize the discomforts of guilt and shame associated with coming into awareness and putting them towards social justice. It is a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing to do. And when we are tired and when we are stressed, we tend to slide backwards. We tend to slide backwards. There's also a skills model for target identities, for oppressed identities. And it starts with survival, um, which we renamed solidarity. Um, but what it often looks like is cutting off anything that doesn't help us survive. Um, it looks like taking off our hijab. It looks like how we wear our hair or putting on the pearls, um, changing our accents so that, so that we survive, so that we're safe. The next stage, right, default behaviors is confusion. And that's when people start to ask themselves, hey, the thing that just happened, did it happen to me because of my target identity? Did it happen to me because I'm Black? Did it happen to me because I'm female? Did it happen to me because I have an accent, right? And what's needed to, to start to shift into empowerment is having time with people who are in our identity groups. Um, that's why we have employee resource groups. That's why we have race-based caucusing. That's why I hang out with all of my Daisy girlfriends once a month because I don't have to explain myself. Um, I don't have to, we have a lot of shared lived experiences. And from there, we step into a place of empowerment, which is saying what you really think and like engaging other people in conversations about your identity and what's happening in the world. And I will tell you that this is a phase that people of color get fired. Women get fired in male dominant environments because we're having all the conversations with all of the people. The people are not ready to have those conversations with us. And we learn from that and we're able to usually step into a place of strategy, which is beginning to slow down enough to see what the work is and finding who is going to help us, right? Like in the morning, Danita said, I've seen this problem before, but I need to slow down and see like what it means to solve for it in this context. What does it mean to solve for it in this context? And the very last skill, right? All, this is not a linear model. Um, we're moving up and down it all the time is recentering. And recentering is getting to a place where we're so grounded that we can value and lift up not just our marginalized identities, but also the marginalized identities of other people. Um, and when we lived with the reality of navigating the world with a lot of marginalized identities, we really struggle to do this. Just like allyship, accompliceship is very hard, so is recentering. So is recentering, right? Recentering is pulling the person behind you up the ladder with you. So this is a gnarly framework to wrap your head around, I'm gonna encourage you to listen to the video um, from Leticia Nieto, and you can just listen to it. It's a YouTube video, but you can just also just listen to it when you're on a walk. So, okay, before we 
go on to the next section. If you have questions, I'm going to invite you to pop them in the chat so we can track them and grab your homework and grab your homework. Okay, two things, questions in the chat, pull up your homework and Pierce will tell us when he's ready to go. We're ready to go. Mm -hmm. We just wanna make sure everyone has their homework available um, to remind folks uh, of what the homework was. Make a list mm -hmm. of people that are in your equity challenge space. Obviously, if we're here to engage in relationships, where are the relationships? Who 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 is affected and who would affect the situation that you are currently <laughs> doing a lot of thinking around, right? Um, so the reason why is because. I recognize as we were discussing this this uh, resource, the um, target agent uh, theory, the skill sets that we discussed, and the uh, positionality wheel. A lot of people in these spaces use those resources as cop outs, mm -hmm. specifically because they stop there, they navel gaze, they focus on themselves even if they're talking about their um, privileged identities or their oppressive identities, and they use that to be the only ways they think about how they engage in this type of work. What am I doing? What do I need to focus on? What have you, right? We're stopping that right now. We're immediately going to practicalize moving out. And by doing so, we're going to be talking about stakeholder maps. So what you have in front of you uh, hopefully, is the homework of one, two, seven, eight, twelve, twenty. Who knows the amount of people that you actually brainstormed and a lot of information about them, possibly. What are their interests in the project? How much are they affected by the problem space? And how much influence they have over that problem space? Excuse me. There are a lot of different ways that you can map a stakeholder. What we're going to do is take that list that you built and turn it into a web that can help you think through what the relationship environment actually looks like. Let me let me explain why we want to focus on this first place. Uh, so we are trying to engage, we're trying to use, implement our minimum viable actions. We're trying to engage longer term our strategy. We're trying to have people buy into that experience. And your actions have consequences. Those actions could have consequences on others. And those other people that are either trying to support or denigrate your issue have issue have consequences based on their actions. What you do ripples out outside of what you actually accomplish. So your actions have effects outside of their first order, right? And for you to effectively strategize it's helpful for you for you to figure out what those relationships actually look like outside of yourself. Let me give you let me give you a few examples. Do you potentially want access to a student board, but you need to get through a teacher? So the main people you're trying to engage with are the students, but the teacher is blocking you from that. Do you want to activate an employee resource group, and their meeting is the place where you where they decide to support your work? Can you see how defensiveness or immaturity of your political leaders keeps an issue for the working class community stagnant? Each one of those examples I just suggested are one of many different instances of you want to cause an effect on the outside world and other relationships will affect how successful that is. This map, this stakeholder map that we're building starts you on the path to figure out not only the relationships you need to build, but how other relationships affect the success of that work. So that's why we're focusing on that in the first place. And the most important thing to do is to clarify the relationship between those stakeholders, at least in your mind first. So what we're going to do is do it together at least once, and then you can practice it afterwards more in depth with more people with more relationships first step get a big piece of paper 
any piece of paper. You might have one right next to you. Take a second, just get one. I have mine right here that I'm gonna be writing on and you need to get something to write with so that you all can see what I'm writing with. I'm gonna be using a big old Sharpie, a collection of Sharpies. I love colors, okay? So pretty please, take some time, cool. Next step, write down the names of five to eight stakeholders that are important to your project. Ta-da! Here are my stakeholders. Nitu, Lauren, Sevda, Amina, Rebecca. Right now, unfortunately, I can't fit everybody else on. I want to make sure you all get a chance to see it. But right, li literally, like you made the list before, write it down right now, pretty please, with sugar on top of the people on your list, okay? Take some time, write them down. I get the feeling that some people are uh, extra credit people and have already done so very quickly. Of these, pick two, literally, any two. It does not matter which two matters. You just need to pick two between them. I'm going to be telling a story. Mine's not going to be an actual true relationship, but you're going to see why I'm going to pick two on my side. Okay. You're going to choose two and you're going to draw on your piece of paper between the two. Ah, you probably can't see that right there. In the same way you're looking at the slide right now, on the slide is Joe and Beth. And then you're going to see in between a arrow, an arrow between the two. And that represents the type of influence one of the stakeholders has on the other. Here, Joe employs Beth. In a perfect situation, the best way to do it is to name it as a verb. All right. So this is a collection of a noun, verb, noun. Joy, Joe employs Beth the most important influential relationship. Keep in mind, if you're thinking about this, you might find multiple influential relationships. Like you might have a relationship between Beth and Joe. Like Beth evaluates Joe yearly for a, uh, in the employee, um, the word is escaping me right now, uh, in the employee evaluation index, right? But the point is, is that you, you've done the most important one, okay? Next, do it again. Add another name, draw another line between the names, and draw the relationship, okay? I'm going to do mine. Um, I'm doing mine. In my imaginary situation, I actually made a mistake up here. My apologies. Please, please forgive me. Nitu employs Sevda. Sevda feeds Amina. I don't know. Just because for the sake of it. In your situation, you have a real relationship. Write the name and write the relationship. Okay? There... If you've written if you've written a name that it, this actually applies, you can actually write two separate lines, one between person one, person two and three, and person one and three. Okay. So think about those relationships. Take a second and write them. Write all of them until they are basically completed, okay? Now, the final stage, not even really a final stage, because the final stage has included everybody that has ever been impacted by your equity challenges. And that's a lot of work, especially for this time and space, but keep going, okay? You keep writing the names and writing the relationships between the people. And you have maps 
this specific stakeholder list. As you can see on the screen, it is a web of relationships between people and how they exert influence on each other. Here's can folks take five minutes to do the activity? Please do. Okay. Absolutely. Take your time. Try to be as accurate as possible. And to be clear, accuracy here might mean you don't know the most important influence, right? The main way, you might not know the best way that Joe exerts influence over Beth. If that's the case, put a question mark. That question mark is also that. That that is important, and you'll see why in a little bit. I want to be clear about a point as you're doing this. So take your time. You have five minutes to complete this, this work to, to the best of your exam. You're just trying to practice this here. What you're doing rarely, rarely happens in social change spaces. People rarely try to map and understand how stakeholders interact with each other. So take some time. We're going to put on uh, a timer for you for about five or so minutes. And we'll be back when your math is done to talk about how you interpret it and why would you want to in the first place. Okay? We cool? Any, any, any questions, any issues with how we're doing this? Copy. All right, we're here for you. might have made the map for it, can learn a lot more by making the map together, by figuring out what's the right ways, what's the right type of influence, who are the right people that should be a part of this bubble, and what relationships do they have with each other. This, my friends, is your first system map that you have probably ever created. Maybe you've made something like this before, but there's a lot of people that I know that haven't done something like this. Here's the benefit. Here's the thing that you now know, right? This is a sense-making resource. You now have clear ideas of how relationships have been built, or you have specific questions that need to be answered. What is the relationship between that person and that person that I don't know? Which parts of the map do I need to see that I currently can't see? Which is why uh, Jen, that's such a powerful question and potentially a resource to influence your funders, your community members, your the, the people that are holding the resource to say, we don't know this, we need to, this is clear, we're going to give an inadequate resource if we don't find out this information. Getting past that is a very difficult issue, but it is a resource for you to make that case. Now, now that you have a map, you can start asking these questions. One, whom holds more power than others? Which stakeholders, which people holds different type or more or active or dominant power over other people in the space? Sit with that for a second. The second point, and the reason why maps are so useful in these spaces, where are interesting leverage points? Most people try to attack an issue by focusing on relationships that they already have instead of relationships that they have yet to build. Where, where are people doing something interesting? Where are some spaces that people haven't tried to address an issue in this space, right? That might mean uh, if there is an administrative specialist, right? Most people try to attack, address, and deal with the boss and talk with them directly. You might talk with the administrative specialist instead and have them get access to the thing that you're focusing on so that it can be made before you talk to the boss, right? Leverage points by going to different parts of the map. Number three, 
What do you need to learn about in the future? This is a frame for research. They're learning more about those relationships. And we likely don't know all of those relationships. That's what the question marks were for. What do we need to learn about and how can it help build a map that can make our, our strategies, our theories of change successful? So here's another way to think about this. Those three questions are valuable. Keep that in your mind. We're going to include those questions into the chat. But next, we can go deeper than that. This is the first step, right? Let's talk about how power moves. This is a big old list, and all of these help you figure out specific, basically what we did can get more granular. Diff one person can hold different types of power. A boss can fire one person, they can fund another, they can help support or help influence another type of stakeholder. Those are different types of power, right? Who holds different types and who holds only one or a few? A person can hold direct or indirect types of power. Direct means I, you say I do, authority. You, you, I say jump, you say how high. Indirect is holding spaces that other people can't see, holding conversations in the back room, um, trying to organize in ways that people don't know or fully recognize. How is the power, is it more direct or is it more indirect based on the systems we're part of? We've already talked about number three, oppressive and liberatory types of power. Is it something that limits people, limits folks at the margins, or is it something that creates and builds for folks at the margins, right? And then you can try to navigate across the entire map how much liberatory power exists. Number four, which people hold a lot of nodes? They influence a lot of different things and which people only influence a few of those things, right? Finally, I'm sorry, number five is power happens over time. Sometimes you exert power and it's immediate. You have to do this now or you lose your job. Sometimes you exert power and it doesn't happen over three or six months. Like it takes time for an administration or a program to actually move. Like I get my uh, residence permit after six months or nine months, right? Which powers have delays and which powers have cutoff points, like a president who only has two term limits, right? Eight years maximum. So all of these things are how you can see the powers exist. Even deeper. What if the stakeholder is not a person? What if it's an organization? What if the stakeholder is a mindset, it's a behavior. It's a thing that affects a lot of different people all at one time. What if the stakeholder is a law or a policy, right? A law affects people in a lot of different ways. It requires them to do something in a lot of different ways. That is, we're dealing with 101 right now. That is 201, 301. That is systems thinking. Exactly. Some of them are organizations or institutions using a specific law, right? There are a lot of ways to characterize the larger system that exists. And the more you make it, and the more in-depth you can build it, the more clear the larger system becomes and how everything inside it affects each other. That is systems thinking. We do not have the time to do that. But what we do can do is give you that resource after the course to think more about how to build that, if that will be useful for you. For now, we think it's critical so that you have a this stakeholder map and you know how to make this one for the, prop, the equity challenge that you're currently focusing on. So that is stakeholder mapping. Take some time, imbibe it, try it out after the course, and we're glad that we can take you through this single resource. Aparna, do you have something to say? I feel like you want to spend the whole day here doing stakeholder mapping. We could just literally be here for three more hours. But we um, can. Yeah. Um, I hope 
like that you have a, a second to just, you know, look at the chat, Mitu's comment around like rubbing influential people. Um, you know, so like, I wish I'd done this before. Jen's question, so powerful. And I think it, this is supporting somebody in a context that you're not in and how to do that responsibly. So what's so hey. once you know this resource, you can't unknow how important relationships are. That's what matters here, recognizing that these specific relationships matter as they change and as they evolve. The unfortunate reality is that we gotta move on. Okay. So we have some tools for you. We have some practical things that you're gonna move, move with. Let's clarify what we've done already. Number one, we focused on understanding yourself your identity, your perspectives, and how that affects how you think about a lot of these issues. And some, some resources help skill up how you engage with those identities. Number two, zooming out, understanding different relationships that hold that are held around you. Obviously, we just talked about that for a while. Number three is specific strategies to engage with people in your circle, in your ecosystem, about how to help them help you. So you have you have a you have a project, you have a strategy you're trying to build. How do you engage with people to help make that thing successful? These are ways to engage. That's what the focus of this resource is. And this is why we're going to spend so much time on this. So first, we need to characterize the type of people we're focusing on. So how do you engage with them? Let's talk about that next. There is a tool in the design thinking and the user experience community called a persona. Let me ask a question for the people that, are, that I can currently see. Who has heard of a persona before? You can raise your hand, you can put your... Okay, cool, nice. Not everyone has, wonderful. Sick, you've built them already, wonderful. Um, Let's go through a definition of what it is for the people that haven't done it. Is this, this what is people call avatar? Also. Okay. Also, very much so. Um, so. In some situations in digital spaces, they might use the phrase avatar as a practical version of a persona. Like you can make your own avatar, you can make your own identity. Many times personas are made by designers, by change makers to say, when I'm engaging out in the world, this is a fictional character influenced by the research I've done. So in this situation, you can make a persona to support your stakeholder strategy. So in social change work, we've done this, we've, we've engaged with a lot of these people, you probably engage with them too, and we've made personas that you can keep in mind as you're doing your work. So the first collection, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to clarify, right? Um, a persona is fictional, but it's based in reality. It's based in reality. It's, it's a way of categorizing people on the basis of certain identity characters. And so like, it's also how things get marketed to us, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, if she listens to Beyonce and she buys like, I don't know, athletic gear, then she likely will also, I don't know, you know, like buy some gym equipment, right? right? Exactly. And so, and then what you're trying to do is you're finding all of the people who listen to Beyonce and wear like athletic clothes to sell them something. Right, so that's that's how you create a persona. Yeah. It's a powerful tool to help you wrap your mind around the type of people that you're going to engage in. We gave you four. Here are the first two. Patrons. Patrons are people that can support what you have going on with their own resources. Okay? 
direct examples. The easiest one is a funder. The funder is the easiest patron, right? They're not the only type of patron, okay? They're people that can support with their, their skill sets. They know how to do a lot. They're polymaths with a lot of things, and they just want to give to help make it happen. They can support with their relationships. They are a they are buzz. They love to go to parties. They love to connect people with people, and they believe in your work, and they know the right person to help for the job. Patrons are the people that support with something that they're offering. And there's a direct way to engage with them that we found very useful. The second is beneficiaries. The phrase I hate saying, but I think it's unfortunately the best one to make sense, they're the targets. In your work, with your strategy, who are you trying to help? Who are the people that will be directly benefited by what you're trying to build? Those are beneficiaries. Most affected by your intervention, the people most proximate to the problem. You might be one of those beneficiaries, very likely, very possible. So those are the first two. The next two are these two, critics and accomplices. The critic, the people who offer pressure on your project. This might mean they are gatekeepers, right? They're like, this ain't happening unless you do this or do that the way that I want you to because I say so because, 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 right? They could be people out in the world that are like, eh, I do it differently, or uh, I don't think this is the way that you should accomplish it. There are a lot of different examples of critics. Tactical pressure, intellectual pressure, financial pressure. It's, you, you, you might be able to give this resource, I might be able to give it to you, or I don't even have a resource, but you're not doing it the right way, so. These are valuable because they offer ways for you to test your rigor, to actually be battle tested. They're the ones that are battling against your, your, your uh, actions. The second, the fourth, my apologies, the fourth are accomplices. These are people who would work alongside you to take the endeavor forward. These are your comrades in arms. These are the folks that are alongside this work. These are the activists. These are the people in your employee resource group. These, if your family believes in you, these are like, you call them into your business to be like, ah, can you please, can you please, can you please to make this happen because we can't do this ourselves, right? So to be clear again, one, patrons, two, beneficiaries, three, critics, four, accomplices. What we have for you for the next, the, the final hour, is basically we have engagement strategies, ways to communicate with these different types of people so that they can help your project. This final thing we're going to name, and we're going to take a little bit of a break before we go into the, the many different breakout rooms. One, these personas aren't perfect. No persona is, right? If there are other personas that you feel make sense, it's like, ah, there's this type of person who's really important, but this isn't resonating with me, there is another name, there's another valuable space to put them in, especially if you think you're going to run into that type of person again. Okay? And that's okay. That's all right. But at least this is a start. Number two, a single person or organization can hold many identities at once, okay? Someone can be a critic and a funder. Someone can be a critic and an accomplice. They're critiquing what's happening, but they believe in the, in the work because they want to put intellectual labor into what you're doing, right? Number three, a person can evolve their identity over time, all right? So someone that was a critic turning into a funder, I'm sorry, a patron, or somebody that you had a relationship with who was an accomplice that turned into a critic, right? For a lot of different work and activities. Each one of these entities, they're not static in time. And how you build the relationships can help affect how these people engage with you and engage with the project. And finally, your identity, their identity can be affected by, I'm sorry, 
their persona, like where they fit in these four, can be affected by their identities. So, for instance, um, folks that have a certain amount of privilege, whether it's education, whether it's uh, racial, whether it's gender, whether it's nationality, like being a cis white male, right, <laughs> from America, might likely to be a patron much more than a critic that you should listen to and take productive feedback from, right? So that is critical to remember that people's identities, all the ones we talked about previously, also affect how you should engage with them as a person. So the next step with these personas, we talked about that, what we're gonna do, each one of the, the reason why we're focusing on these is not only because it's important to think of these personas, is because we have specific strategies that we feel are very, very important to help you engage with this type of person when you meet them. So the next stage with each one of these activities, we're gonna give you a tactic to use to practice and then we're gonna practice them together. Does that make sense? Ooh, a lot of content, a lot of information. I understand why you did so, and I am angry at the fact that you did so. And I'm just gonna sit with that angry. Let's dive in. We got a lot of, a lot of uh, workshops to do in a short amount of time. Step one. Patrons, this is someone who can support your endeavor with their resources. Those at the bottom left, you can see some examples, some funny, hopefully all of them true, of different types of patrons, owners of a convention center, a social butterfly, are they ever selfless? A community historian. So people that can give and feel comfortable giving if they know what you're actually offering. So the next little bit, you're gonna see some of the spice in this later. Here's the tactic. It's called SNAP. The resource that, per, that made, the person that made this is a uh, creator at Mind Valley, um, who is an organization that does a lot of different personal development tools. And they use this as a tool to replace the traditional elevator pitch in 60 to 120 seconds, answer these questions quickly. What's your name and what do you represent? Your org, initiative, or place, whatever that makes sense. What is the result of the change you're building? Not what do you do? This is very hard for people to understand. But what is, what, because of what you do, what is created? What is in it for the person you're talking to? What do they get out of it? And why should they care about it in the first place? That's the engagement piece. Finally, what questions can you ask to move the project forward? For a patron, that might mean, can you offer this? Can you fund this? Do you know anyone that can help with this? Do you know any information that can help with this? When you're engaging with a patron, whoever, whatever that might look like, as soon as you recognize who they are, you can use SNAP to get them to get involved. Let me give you an example of what this looks like, okay? I'm gonna say my SNAP, and you all hopefully are gonna critique it, see if it sounds okay, and you can get an idea of what a SNAP sounds like. 60 to 120 seconds. I'm going to actually stopwatch myself as it's happening, so you can see how fast it goes. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Pius Oklahile Gordon, and I build practical knowledge resources for equitable social change agents across the globe. The project that I've designed have been a lot of different ones, from guiding national entrepreneurship policy for Botswana, running successful mayoral campaigns for the Deep South, and building, building life-saving PPE infrastructure for local communities in the Deep South during COVID. Supporting my work means that your colleagues and comrades 
will clearly learn, collaborate, and build a future together with equity and creativity at its core. Do you know anyone that needs knowledge power to transform their social change work? And if so, can you introduce me to them? You're good. You're good. That's a snap. That is a snap. I appreciate you giving me the, the advice. This I'm going to give you some snaps on that. I appreciate, hey, I appreciate <laughs> you. I appreciate that. I'm not here for compliments. I'm here so that you all know how to do this. Wow. I don't know if I can do that. You don't have yeah. to. Yeah. Thank you, Danita, for saying that out loud. Seeing it out you loud. Not, here's, the, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Honestly, truly, I've known about SNAP and I've tried doing it for at least seven years. Right. I've practiced it. I've facilitated it with other people. Literally, the only thing that's stopping you from doing this is practice. Yeah. So what we're doing is practicing. Help Step me. one, practice. you're going to write your script. Step oh, two, can do it. we're going to get you in groups of two to practice it with each other over and over and over for a small amount of time. Yes, you can get a copy of that. However, what I want to do is make sure <laughs> you listen, listen, we ain't here to say what we can't do, my friends. All right. We here to mess up and to try something and be like, ah, I didn't. But wait, that was great. What you just did. You're right. I could try that and I could say it again. And I could and I could and I could and I could to the feels second nature. Hey, I fully understand and I appreciate you naming that reality. And honestly, these tactics are not perfect for every environment and for every situation. But the important thing around this tactic is recognizing you feeling comfortable with telling your story quickly and communicating what you need with someone that you're trying to engage with. That is mine. Ooh, Rebecca, I see your hand raised. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, real quick. Pierce, is this meant to be a one-on-one -on -one communication or was that a pitch at a room? That this direct one is normally made for one-on-one, -on -one, traditionally. Okay. It right. is how it is adapted for a pitch in a room depends on how you're trying to pitch to them, right? Do you have a slide deck? You know, you, is it like a long-term relationship? The, the themes of focusing on who I am, what I accomplish, what you're in for, and what they can directly do to help can be applied to a room. The important thing here is recognizing that this resource helps you build something like that. And most of the conversations we expect that you're going to have are usually going to be one-on-one -on -one to start. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So groups of two. One, write rough snaps. Two, practice them. Okay? You have 10 okay, minutes. I'm going to open. I'm going to review of all their internal documents. So how they go about recruiting, um, how they go about onboarding, training, um, how they engage volunteers, what type of roles do they have volunteers for, and how do they retain volunteers. Um, um, and then we also had focus groups and stakeholder interviews with some um, internal and external stakeholders, um, volunteers, um, some of the staff as well, and uh, did kind of an audit of all of that with our quantitative researcher and then um, provided a report on recommendations, findings, and themes. And then we're going to go into coaching on how they can implement um, recommendations. Do people have immediate why questions they would like to ask Tia? Yeah. If not, yeah. oh, Dyron, go ahead. And in terms of the data collection, why, um, why was that strategy chosen? As the appropriate strategy. Good question. 
Um, the reason why that was cho chosen as like our data uh, methodology is because we didn't have any, um, we had to basically base everything off of qualitative research and quantitative data that they had. We didn't have any quantitative data at all, but it was also a way for us to engage um, some of the naysayers and also people that support the work um, to ensure that they have a voice on kind of what is going to be done and how we're going to change uh, from an equity lens in the future. Thank you, Don. Thank you, too. Who's next? Pierce, do you want uh, more why questions or do you want a oh, new why person? Questions. Thank you for the more question. Why. More yeah. why questions. You will know when the hows are coming. So get them ready. Maybe just a like high level one. Why now? Like what was it at this organization that prompted this particular um, focus at this moment in time? Good question. So um, this came about for the agency because um, they, I think I talked about this in our work session last week, but um, all of the volunteers are retired white and it does not mirror the community that they serve. So um, from a funding standpoint, but also uh, really engaging the community, um, this is, they decided that they need to do something now um, or else one, they'll lose funding, but two, um, they're not going to get the representation they want at the refuge. Okay. Is there any final why questions? I have one. Mm -hmm. Why do people volunteer for this? Um, good question. So um, when I talk to some of the volunteers one on one, um, the main reason why a lot of them volunteer at this particular refuge is because it aligned a lot with the career they did before they retired. So um, some of that like uh, common interest is the main reason why, but then also um, they work very closely with the elementary school. So it's another way for them to give back directly to an elementary school and hopefully um, kind of enable some of the students to think about being um, naturalists in the future. Yeah. That makes sense. How questions. I need some how questions for my people. That's how exciting. are you? Oh, uh -oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Did I run? No, you, you, you. This is you. No, I was just going to ask to just see the slide one more time before I ask my question. Or am I overthinking? <laughs> um, I'm going to ask my how. I'm going to think in my how question. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. How are you going to reach people that are not current volunteers? So the goal is to work, uh, one of the recommendations in our report is to um, work with the internal team at the service to really develop a um, recruitment strategy that thinks about uh, recruiting from local organizations, but also some of the corporate organizations and really get engaging some of the ERG groups um, that might have um, interests with outside activities or sustainability. We're kind of tying it into sustainability outside and environmental. You guys are prepping me for um, when I get ready to do my readout. Let's go. <laughs> Dairon, go ahead and speak up. Yes, yeah, so my how is around the system itself because hearing you speak, it reminded me about, I think you mentioned the challenges that I think the location or the hours just don't work for the people that you want, that um, you're targeting for including into volunteering space. And so I guess my how question is, how would the system need to change in order to allow um, mm. people of different um, identities, groups, et cetera, to take part, um, you know, non-working people, um, people who are disabled, et cetera, 
people within companies, outside of companies, et cetera, et cetera. Great question. So one of our recommendations is also to redefine the volunteer opportunities. So a lot of the volunteer opportunities are really geared towards the refuge, like refuge first, but we're telling them to take more of a people first approach. And what are some of those that fall outside of like taking care of the refuge roles that people can do? So for example, they have like naturalist roles, um, trail rovers, people that work in the gift shop. However, there might be opportunities to actually go out to community organizations or go out to um, fairs and talk about the word. And those happen on the weekends. Those happen after hours. Um, festival season is a huge season that they can have people go out and do some volunteer work as well. But then also just some admin support, um, cleaning up around the park. So uh, really meeting people where they are when we think about volunteer opportunities and they're not just focused on taking care of the refuge only. I guess so, the... um, Go ahead. Sorry. No, you're fine. It's just for me to uh, reflect on what you said, T.S. We're focusing the efforts on, on the importance. It's not just the importance of keeping the main activity going, but if you want to change how you, you know, attract people, it's about what would make them interested in coming over to the other side. Yeah. So, I gotta cut it off. I saw interest in asking more questions and that's what tends to happen exactly when we don't have enough time. But you all see the importance, you see the purpose, you see how to do this because we just did it a whole bunch of different ways. Lots of different why questions we can ask. Lots of different how questions we can ask. You can do the exact same for your beneficiaries to get a better perspective of where they're coming from and how you can best serve them. And that's the purpose here. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about critics. Folks that don't, they think you suck. They think the project sucks. They think something about it is not, mm, eh, I could have done it better, but, but they didn't do it better. Um, these are <laughs> maybe bosses, right? Maybe administrative gatekeepers, maybe social media users, maybe community organizers and activists, maybe some other people in your family that feel like they know how to do things, but they don't know how to do things the way you think you know how to do. Ah, listen, these people are valuable. All right. The question is, how do we take stock of the value that they could present in these spaces? Here's the tactic. This is from the user experience field. Anybody who creates an app or creates a resource that's well designed is because you had user experience people that did a lot of testing and had people critique it on their behalf. So the tactic here Pardon, yeah, there it is. Design feedback. At its core, this is a mindset. The idea here, the most important thing, is that whatever you built is separate from you as a creator. It is not a representation of your ego, not a representation of what you are able to do or what you're able to accomplish. It is by itself incomplete. And you're trying to get ideas as to make it complete, right? So you're asking someone who's critiquing you, you're ask, they're asking you questions or they're saying, this is not good. Or that's, you do this the wrong way or you're supposed to do that, what have you. And you are cherry picking the core, not me, wrong phrase. You are appropriately picking the things that are uh, useful, that are productive, that help you adapt or evolve. And you're throwing away the things that don't help you. The mindset here, you're asking yourself potentially these four questions. Who is this person to the project? Would they be affected by it? Are they just loud and not really supporting what's going to be helping? Are they a gatekeeper, right? Who, are, who is it to them? And this isn't something you have to directly, add. it's just a mindset you need to think about and keep in mind whether or not this is really, really critical or not. Number two, what do you want to learn from them? Are they an expert in their community? Do they know finance in the project? Do they know how to mechanistically create the thing you're trying to build. And then are they giving feedback on that skill set that they offer? And if not, how do you 
take away or make productive what they're offering? Why do they care about their brand? What's behind them, right? What are they holding that makes them important? Are they holding a frustration because people haven't done the work they think necessarily? Are they interested in making that thing work the way it needs to happen? If that works, will they lose their job, right? All of these things are useful to think about how you should either integrate that into changing the feedback or changing the feedback a different way. And then finally, this is the most important thing. They said a thing. What do you do to change what you built based on what they said, right? Sometimes it's a thank you, appreciate your feedback, goodbye, and you do nothing. Sometimes it's really critical what they said, you need to change something. Okay, so keep these things in mind as you're getting feedback. Here's how we put it into practice. Uh, one second, Darlan, I want to finish this second se section, one, the final piece. You all are going to go back into breakout groups and share your MVA. Okay, you're going to share what you're talking about, what you've been working on, what have you, and then the other person is going to be a critic. They're going to say, why that doesn't work, why that doesn't make sense, what, what, what's happening here. Maybe ask questions about it, but say, this is what I would do or that doesn't work here. Then you're going to ask questions of them, figuring out what you might do differently so that you can get experience having someone rag on your project. Okay? We do that as much time as we can for each individual person, and then we come back and talk about the last tactic. Uh, Darwin, did you have a, a question? Yeah, it was just to, um, I guess, solidify what you're saying is that the lens in which we look at a situation unfolding in front of us and where someone is critiquing could be in a, in a, from a space of, okay, positivity, how can what is happening here help me further my goals and interests as a, in terms of the equity challenge? I would use I would use the words instead of positivity as distance and productivity. Like you are distance from the thing you're building so that it doesn't affect you somatically, like, oh my God, I'm so bad. I, I didn't do this the right way. No, so that you can be distanced from it. And so that you can ask your question, what can I learn to make my thing better? Uh, positivity might be a part of that, it might be useful, but it does not have to be. Okay, we also have a, a comment in the chat which says, how do you identify a critic uh, when a critic is just a blocker um, and that can't be moved? And what if they are important to, yeah, what if they're an important stakeholder? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I would ask them some of these questions. What do you wanna learn from them? What do you want to understand about why they're being a blocker? I had an experience yesterday with a CEO who was being a blocker on an employee engagement survey. And I sent him an email and I said, these are your three options. Which one do you want to go with? And he came back and he said, oh, whatever you and the CPO think is the best option, of course. And I was like, great. Well, why have, right? Like, um, and so sometimes, yeah, you can you can move them. We want to send you off into breakouts for a little bit to get some feedback on your MVAs. Um, so we're going to do that now. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. Do you have your MVA, your minimum viable action? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. And then what's going on? Leandra, who are you with? I was not with anybody because my Wi-Fi went down, so I didn't have a last partner. Oh. Um, okay, I'm going to, let's see. Right. Put our own steps together. Yep. Yep. 
I did that. And then do you want to stay with us? Sure. An explanation as to why you're doing your work. I'm sorry, say that one more time. Not every time that you explain, this is what I'm doing and you get the feedback. Once they give the feedback, you might not have to explain why you made a decision as a defense. As a, here's a direct example. I made this app. I did this thing. I went down this direction. How do you feel about it? <clears throat> ah, it sucks. You should make people punish people in a particular app in a particular way so that it incentivizes them to do the work. Oh no, the reason why I was trying to do, thank you. Great feedback. I'm glad for that. Let's move on. Okay. It might be easier. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to say that I think it's going to be really important for you to connect with your buddies this week and yeah. pick pick one of the four, right? Like pick the persona that you're most needing to influence right. and practice and, and practice the piece that goes with it. I know we're moving through a lot of this stuff really fast. I want to honor and acknowledge that we learn and think differently, right? Like neurodivergence is a very real thing. That is the truth. The reality is that speed often matters a lot in how we're able to communicate, especially when we have FaceTime with yeah. leaders, influencers, and decision makers, which is why the snap really matters which is why the snap really matters um so yeah okay home stretch um home stretch final piece one final tactic that unfortunately we don't have time to hold the space for right now but we're going to tell you how to do it and it will be a part of your essential work in the future let's talk about accomplices these are people, your ride or dies, the people you're trying to connect with, the people that will help you on the path, the people you feel comfortable delegating work to. Best friends, the enemy of my enemy, affinity group members, activists, whoever comes to mind that are on that path with you to make the change that you agree needs to be made. How do you engage with them? The four C's. A tool to make delegation practical. These are the four C's. One, connect. Two, context. Three, commitment. And four, catapult. The main focus here, number one, is to start with who you are, why this issue matters, and how they've been affected. You connect with them to make sure you know what you, they, they know what you stand for, okay? Context, talk about the action, talk about why it matters, what the challenges are, and figure out what they don't understand about it. Why is it an issue? Why do they need to address it now? And what are the tactics people are trying to take to get? That's just overall the context of the thing. Next step, commitment. You need direct, immediate tactics. You absolutely know that they can take on your behalf. All right, you ask them. Can you knock doors with us? This is from organizing communities. Can you send this to your listserv? Can you set up a workshop for me? Can you give me $5 million? Or can we negotiate on the amount of money you can give me to help endeavor with that work? You're listening for a absolutely yes, or a, oh, I'm not sure, I might want to, or no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. If it's a authoritative yes, I would love to, they're in your path. They are your accomplice. And then you respect them by giving them the work and having them hold the responsibility. That's the final tactic, the catapult. So, come, uh, shoot, I just forgot the last, the first one. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, connect, context, commitment, catapult. Connect, context, commitment, catapult. Here is your task. Write your scripts. Think of an individual 
that is in your context that you want to make and accomplish, that you want to help with the work somehow, whatever that work is, and write your answers for each of these. Connect. The slide before the first two C's, Lauren asked for the fun. Thank you for, for asking that question. Connect, context, commitment, and catapult. Oh, the first two. Yep. Yeah. Also, keep in mind as well, everybody, that you will have these slides. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. Yeah. So this final task, and the share we want you to bring to your buddies, Aparna. The sharing to... that we, yeah, is to pick a persona that you need to connect with, influence, pick the strategy that goes with them and practice with your buddy. Practice with yeah. your buddy. So what's important to represent, to understand in all these spaces, let's go back a little bit to the stakeholder map, okay? You are not the center of this space. You feel like it because you're trying to move in their work, you're focused on your environment, you're trying to make it work, you're trying to connect with the right people, but you are not the center. You likely hold some of these personas, you hold some of these identities, and you have influential relationships where people influence you or you influence others in this space. The work here is to take a second, dive into where I am in this to make sure that I'm not over-centering myself and that I understand what I can contribute to make this work happen. What, what, what should I offer? What, what insights do I have to present? How am I critiquing my own work? And how can I take off some of the work to other spaces because I'm holding too much at one time? That is essential for making sure this work sustains itself because it's a web of sustaining. It shouldn't be sustained only by you. As hard as that is, especially for people that work as a community of one. So, skills in this work. We want to make sure we go through this as quickly as possible. Uh -oh. Yeah, exactly. We're not by ourselves. There's something happening with the slide, Aparna, I think, on my side. There we go. So, Thank you, Emily. We appreciate you staying for what you can. If you need to go, please go. Um, we're going to hit on this last little sections and then have everyone. Okay. We're going to be here for about 15 minutes left. So seeing connections is critical for this able to work. Your actions cause other actions, and those relationships exist outside your purview. So you need systems thinking to make sure you're doing seeing connections appropriately. The next step here is community agility. What do I mean by that? Treat different people differently. Don't treat everyone like they're all the same. A funder is not a, I'm sorry, a patron might not be a critic, but if you treat them like they're trying to defend, like they're trying to attack what you're doing, then you might be taking the wrong strategy. You need to adapt yourself based on the people that you're engaging with. And finally, sacrifice. You have to make sure that you're supporting others as you ask for support, all right? Because that's a strong, powerful, essential way that we start to build relationships that aren't just skin deep. We're looking for people to help support. That might mean that we ask, what do you need and deliver on that at the same time? That's one of my favorite conversations to have with people when I end a statement with them. I ask, what do you need in those conversations? So keep in mind those three resources, seeing connections, sacrifice, oh my goodness. Community agility. Community agility by internet just started glitching. So that is it for today. <laughs> That's a lot of information. We're gonna ask you to breathe. We're gonna ask you to take in the context. You're gonna be you're going to be thinking about a lot of this for a while. I admit that because that's the trend from the last conversations. Uh, please do so. Please take the time for how to integrate this appropriately. But we also finally have some homework for you. Aparna. Yeah. The last yeah. Homework is um, 
not everybody has a theory of change. Um, some people may not have an equity challenge fully defined yet. I, I would really start to get clear on what that is and share it with, share it with people in your context. Um, what Stephanie did, right? Like shared some of the work that she's doing here, got perspective, don't wait to start sharing and having those conversations. Work on your stakeholder map, practice with your buddy. And there is a short article, you're gonna get the link in the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, read it, it's 500 words. Um, I would say the extra credit is read the source document. It's also gonna be linked. Uh, the source document is an academic paper. It's Mm, it is crunchy, okay, if, like we're not used to reading that kind of text, but at least read the short document called Circular and send us your videos, right? Send us your questions. We're, we're here. We're happy. Um, we're happy to, yeah, to be a resource. Mm -hmm. And next week's session, okay, I think I'm going to put it in my email I think next week's session is going to be really hard for a lot of people. Um, we're going to do some race-based caucusing. Um, and that can be challenging for different people. If you've never done it, we're going to really dig into our own relationships to trauma, our relationship to change, how we make sense of the world. I really, I would love for you to bring some water, take some deep breaths, you know, and really be checking in with yourself. We're going to go slow next week. We're not, we don't have a super content heavy session. It's a role process heavy session. And if you're like me, um, I hate it. I, I really, really hate that kind of work. Um, but I know that it's the most important work because the technical solutions are only only going to be sticky if we're doing some of the personal work. The technical solutions are not going to land without doing some of our deeper personal work. So lots of bits and bobs. Get through as much of it as you can. Reach out. If you have questions, pop them in the chat before you leave. We'll hang around for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And... Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Lots of content. Y'all did amazingly. We're here if you need us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Say thank you. I am like a two of five in relation.